Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone to please turn their mobile phones and other devices for silent during the meeting. Apologies have been received from Tavish Scott and Oliver Mundell and we are welcome to committee this morning Alison Harris who is substituting for Oliver Mundell. Agenda item one is a decision on whether to take agenda item eight in private today, which is consideration of our work programme. Are members content to take that in private? Thank you. Second item today is agenda item two, consideration of a negative instrument of subordinate legislation, the St Mary's Music School Aided Places Scottish Amendment Regulations 2019, SSI 2019-144. This is a negative instrument instrument and details are provided in paper one. Do members have any comments on this instrument? Mr Greer. Thanks, Convener. Um, <clears throat> it's not a question on uh, this instrument uh, specifically, because this one makes relatively minor changes, but it would be useful if the committee could write to the government to ask when the next full SSI on uh, St Mary's is to come. This is something that comes relatively infrequently before the Parliament, and from the best I've seen, it's historically not been particularly scrutinised, so it would be useful to get an indication from the government of when the next full SSI is coming. I think we'd be content to do that. Yes, um, we'll organise that, Mr De Greer. Um, so, agenda item three is it. The evidence on two affirmative instruments amending the Children and Young People's Act in relation to funded childcare. These are pieces of draft subordinate legislation which are subject to the affirmative process Information about the instruments are provided in papers two and three. These affirmative instruments have three agenda items. The first item is an opportunity for the Minister to talk to the two instruments and for members to ask the Minister and her officials questions for clarification. We will then turn to agenda items four and five, where there will be debates on the two motions on the instruments that are published in the agenda. So I welcome to the meeting this morning Marie Todd, MSP, Minister for Children and Young People, Alison Cumming, Deputy Director of Early Learning and Childcare, and Nico Mackenzie-Whetton, Lawyer, Legal Directorate of the Scottish Government. I would like to invite the Minister to make an opening statement to explain the two instruments. Good morning. Um, in partnership with local government, we've made an ambitious commitment to almost double the funded early learning and childcare entitlement for all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds from August 2020. This package of orders will provide the necessary legislative basis to underpin the work that local authorities are already doing to deliver an expanded ELC offer, which is high quality, flexible and responsive to parental demand from August 2020. The first order provides for changes to the maximum and minimum session lengths for the delivery of funded ELC. These are currently set at a minimum session length of 2.5 hours and a maximum session length of 8 hours. The changes in this order will extend the maximum session length to 10 hours or less and will remove the minimum session length. These changes will support our efforts to ensure that Scotland's ELC offer is sufficiently flexible for families. Extending the maximum session length means that families can have the option of a full 10-hour session of funded ELC, which is more closely tied to the working day. We understand that 10-hour sessions are commonplace for many families, with those who can purchasing the additional two hours of ELC as wraparound care. We'd like to ensure that parents can access the entirety of 10-hour sessions through their funded entitlement. The order removes the minimum session length, as we consider this to be unnecessary in the context of the expanded entitlement. Care Inspectorate uh, registration requirements will continue to ensure a high quality service is delivered, regardless of the session length. It is intended that the changes to session length will come into force on 1 August 2019. Introducing the changes ahead of the full rollout of 11.40 hours will support local authorities to provide more flexibility on session lengths and to test new models of delivery during the phasing period. This order will not place an obligation on settings to provide 10-hour sessions where they are not already offered. Local authorities should continue to ensure that funded ELC is delivered through an appropriate mix of providers and patterns of delivery within their authority area. The second order proposes that the mandatory amount of funded ELC to which eligible children are entitled is changed in legislation from 600 hours to 1140 hours. Subject to parliamentary approval, this will come into force from the 1st of August 2020. 
We are 15 months away from a national rollout of 1140 hours. I am proud that more than 11,000 children are already benefiting from early phasing of the expanded hours. Laying these orders now signals our continued commitment to deliver the expanded offer from August 2020 and our confidence in local authority readiness to fulfil their duty. We have robust joint governance arrangements to ensure that local authorities have the required capacity and capability in place and, we are, and are well supported <coughs> as they prepare for August 2020. We want every single one of Ch Scotland's children to grow up in a country where they feel loved, safe, respected and able to reach their full potential. I have been heartened by the shared commitment across Parliament to our transformative policy ambition to expand ELC entitlement to 1140 hours by 2020. I am determined and confident that together we will deliver for Scotland's children and their families. Thank you, Minister. I will now move to questions from the committee and invite Mr Gree. I uh, w uh, welcome the, the, the instruments, uh, including the increase from 600 funded hours to 1140 funded hours. So, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not arguing against that. But I, I just wanted to um, explore something around it. I mean, it's my understanding that what we're doing here is providing an entitlement, a universal entitlement to uh, funded hours uh, to early years education for every child in Scotland in the two years running up to their entry to formal education. That's right, yeah. But there is, a, there is a group of children who are excluded from this. That is, children whose parents have chosen to defer their entry uh, to P1, but whose birthdays fall before the end of the year. Um, and in those cases, the local authorities have the discretion to refuse this entitlement. And I, I really want to understand why the Scottish Government isn't taking this opportunity to correct that anomaly. So, for children with September to December birthdays, they will still have continue to have an automatic right to school deferral. So let me be clear about that. Those children do have a right to school deferral. It will remain at the local authority's discretion whether or not they're entitled to additional um, childcare funding. But I would expect local authorities to make this decision based on assessment of the child's well-being and uh, along with um, the parental input um, you know, parents need to be provided with um, accurate information and should be fully involved in the decision-making process. I'm not intending to change that. But, but there's an anomaly here, isn't there? Because the parent's right to defer entry to primary one is not based on any judgment about the child's readiness for going to primary one, apart from the parental judgment. But then their, in, their in access to this other entitlement, which is to early years education in a nursery, is based on some kind of judgment which is at the discretion of the local authority. So, in many local authorities, by asserting one entitlement to defer, the parent is losing this other entitlement which we don't think should be at the local authority's discretion. That's why you're bringing forward this statutory instrument. So there is an inconsistency and an anomaly here which could be readily corrected, and I do not understand why the government's not prepared to correct it. So I'm comfortable with the flexibility that this legislation offers. Parents absolutely have a right to defer should they choose to, and we've been very clear about that. Local authorities will make the decision based on the child's well-being and interests in conjunction with the parents. I'm comfortable with that. But, but, but that means that families' ability to continue with the early years education of their child, having chosen to defer, depends on firstly where they live, and secondly, on how much money they've got, because some families won't well, be able to afford to self-fund. Are you really saying that you're comfortable with that? Are you really saying that? that local authorities do not make the decision in conjunction with the parents and in, with the child's well-being at their heart? But that's not my question. My question isn't for local but authorities. My question is for you, Minister. Are you comfortable with the fact that for this group of children and their families, 
their ability to get the entitlement we are legislating for. Their ability here to get today. the entitlement oh, me, is at the discretion excuse of Excuse me, let me finish. That entitlement depends on how much money the family has and whether they can afford to pay that for nursery education. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. That entitlement depends on the discretion of the local authority who will make the decision in conjunction with the parents based on the well-being of the child. Do you think that those children... You... Do, you, do you think that those children whose parents have decided to defer should continue to have access to early years education on a funded basis? I think that that is a decision for local authorities who will make that decision based on the well-being of the child and in conjunction with the parents. But why, why are we considering a statutory instrument which provides a universal entitlement at the hand of <coughs> excuse me, the government and parliament for all children except these ones? Why are they different? I don't, why should that be at the discretion of local authorities? But for other children, it's not. I mean, I can only reiterate again. I believe it is appropriate for um, what we have done is built in sufficient flexibility. The vast majority of children will start school at the age that they are due to start school. For those children with a January birthday, they will be entitled to automatic further funding. For those children with a birthday from August to December, they will be, their funding will be at the discretion of the local authority who will make that decision based on the welfare of the child in conjunction so, with the so parents. Why are you and I am, on this I am, group of children I am to confident them? that the local authorities all over Scotland can discharge that duty appropriately. I am confident that my local authority colleagues can do that. So you're comfortable with a situation where some families will be able to make that decision because they can afford to continue to pay or they can afford to begin to self-fund nursery education where other families will have to either send their child to school before they think their child is ready or will have to withdraw their child for a year from early years education. You are comfortable with that. So, let me reiterate again. No, I'm not I, asking you to reiterate. I'm asking you, are you comfortable I am with co that position? Are I am, you comfortable with it? I am comfortable with the local authorities discharging their duties towards the children in their local authority area. I am comfortable that we can clarify the guidance um, and the basis for so, exercising discretion in a refresh of statutory guidance, and I think that the system will work appropriately. So, so, so why are we imposing the 1140 hours on local authorities? Why not give them discretion as to whether they think that's appropriate for the, the children or not? It's, it's anomalous. Why, why, why are I we think imposing that? You call that? it anomalous, I call it flexible. <laughs> I think we'll move on. Um, Ms Smith, sorry. Uh, thank you. And can I first of all associate uh, myself with the questioning uh, of Ian Gray? Uh, the Minister, there is an anomaly, and I do hope that the government uh, will consider its uh, response to Mr Gray. Um, on another issue, uh, Minister, um, you'll recall uh, two years ago that uh, Audit Scotland was um, pretty critical of the Scottish Government's arithmetic about the funding that was required. So can I draw your attention to uh, the second uh, instrument here, where you say that you've identified an additional uh, recurring revenue cost of £567 million per annum from 2021-22 and an additional uh, £476 million capital cost for the four financial years from 2017-18 to 2020-21. Could I ask you, Minister, um, what makes you comfortable about uh, these particular statistics, given that the previous ones were so heavily criticised by Audit Scotland? So I'm confident, I mean, if you remember, we came to an agreement with local authorities. It was a shared decision that these were the appropriate costs. And we came to an agreement together that that was what was required to deliver the funded entitlement. Um, and Audit Scotland um, conducted their audits before those negotiations were complete. 
By the time those negotiations were complete, we had interrogated the data on both sides and we were comfortable with the decision that we came to. That's what gives me the confidence um, that, the, that the figures that we have agreed upon, us and local authorities together, have jointly agreed are the appropriate figures to move forward with this. So, in, in response to that, can I just ask, I mean, one, one of the criticisms of Audit Scotland at the time was that um, the engagement of the stakeholders who were uh, due to provide this uh, service um, had not been fully consulted and that some of the uh, arithmetic that they had was very different from the one that the Scottish Government had. Um, in, in, in relation to these statistics that are in our papers today, uh, have you got commitment from the providers that these uh, are accurate, not just from COSLA, but from those who are in the uh, private sector who are obviously having to deliver additional care? So the agreement, the funding agreement was between ourselves and COSLA. I think that you're referring to partner provider funding am, rates. Yep. And at the moment, I mean, you'll be aware that we're working all over Scotland on improving partnership and um, the partner provider rates are increasing in some situations by over 50% to ensure that partner providers are paid a sustainable rate. And yes, we have adequately funded that. OK, so you, you can produce uh, the evidence from those who are in um, the public-private partnership deals uh, that these statistics that you've produced here are correct? Yeah. Would it be possible for the committee to have that? Yeah. Thank you, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Ms Lamont? Yeah, I just want to come back just very briefly to the points that have been um, raised by uh, Ian Gray. Have you got or have you done any um, equality impact assessment on a decision um, which may mean that some young people who ought to defer and everyone's agreed they should defer, will decide not to because they can't afford early years provision if they, if they do defer. Can I just reiterate again that the local authority make the decision? No, I understand to, that. To, I'm asking you so why, why the local authority is so being you're, The presumption that you're putting to me is that a local authority would make a decision not to apply discretion in a situation where everybody has agreed that a child should defer. Well, why would you not give the, the family certainty? Or why would you not ask the... I've asked, have you done an equality impact assessment? And many young people might be involved in this. Why would you choose to give discretion in this element when you've decided there should be no discretion in the other elements? And simply, do you accept the argument that for some families there is agreement that they should defer, but by deferring, they're not able then to access their entitlement to early years education? And they then, as a consequence, may decide, even though everybody agrees it's the right thing to do, decide not to. I mean, this is an issue about um, not just the family feels the child might not be ready, it may be about um, disability, it may be about development issues and so on. So they may, everybody might agree, but they then do not guarantee them the same entitlement to their peers. And I, I put it to you again, Ms Lamont. In what situation would a local authority make a decision which was against the best interests of a child? Well, In that situation, if everybody is agreed... Um, why not make it certain? And just sure. like the... Like because the, the like, because like you, you might say, why would a local authority not give somebody 1,100 hours? Surely they wouldn't just give them 600. You've ensured certainty, so which I everybody welcomes. Why not certainty? It's not a huge group of young people. It's not a huge group If you were going to do an equality impact assessment on it, you might discover it's quite a significant issue in terms It's of not equity. a huge group of young people, I agree. And I am confident, let me reiterate again, I am fully confident that my local authority colleagues are making these decisions appropriately. Could it be reasonable for families to expect more than your confidence that they should expect the same entitlement that other young people might have? I think the system at the moment provides sufficient flexibility and discretion. Can you local ask authorities you, make what do you the decision. Flexibility local authorities make the decision based on the best interests of the child and in conjunction with Can the parents. Can I ask you what you mean by flexibility in these circumstances? Flexibility to do what? They, let me just reiterate again. Local authorities make the decision based on the best interests of the child using GERFEC principles, as they do in many decisions mm -hmm. in providing um, entitlement to the children in the local authority so area. You... They make those decisions along with parental input. What you're the way that you're framing this to me 
is that you are saying that routinely local authorities Did make poor decisions which aren't based in the best interests of the no, children. I, I have confidence that my local authority colleagues are making good decisions based on the best interests of the mm -hmm. child and working along with the parents. I can't say any more than that. So would you be willing to do an analysis of what, how, how many young people are involved, how many defer, and of them, how many um, then do get support for early years, and some kind of survey, some equality impact assessment on those who may be Certainly. making, Absolutely. those who may be more wanting, than happy to work with local authority to defer, but they then have to decide to send them to school anyway. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to work with local authority colleagues to explore that. I'll and work with COSLA you, to explore that. Thank you. Dr Allen. Thank you. Um, like others, I'd certainly welcome the extension uh, of the rights that's in this piece of uh, legislation. Um, I just wondered if you could say anything about how this fits in with a wider question of workforce planning, because the, the rights in themselves obviously are only meaningful if, if local authorities have, have planned to have the workforce there to to put them into practice. So can I ask, is there anything being done to encourage workforce planning around the country for local authorities to be able to, to do some of this? There's been a great deal of work going into ensuring that we have adequate workforce um, in August 2020 when this is due to be delivered. There's been an increase in um, apprenticeship availability. There's been an increase in college courses, an increase in university courses. Um, we are confident that um, we will achieve adequate workforce. We have a joint delivery board, my, which is co-chaired by myself and Councillor Stephen McCabe from COSLA around the table. We have a number of representatives, Director of Education, Solace, Chief Executive, um, Finance, um, personnel from local authorities. And all of us are monitoring both data and intelligence from every local authority area in Scotland on issues like workforce workforce to ensure that we are on target, that we are um, achieving the workforce that we expected to achieve by this phase of delivery. Thank you. Sorry, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Could I just ask you, you know, you know I've listened with interest and I appreciate that you, you, you're absolutely confident that things will work out, but I would like to just put to you very genuinely, for those children who don't get the extra year, how do you feel that they're actually receiving the best outcome? Um, I am confident that local authority colleagues will make decisions on deferral based on the best interests of the child working with the parents. This entitlement um, gives people an entitlement from age three um, to two years of 1140 hours of childcare. We know that quality is vitally important to delivering the outcomes that we want to see for children. We've built in a number of quality characteristics. There is early entrance possible for children from certain um, you, you, families um, who are entitled to it. So families who claim certain benefits are entitled to this from age two. I am confident that this package will meet the needs of children in Scotland and will improve outcomes for them. I, I would just like to come back to, you know, whilst I appreciate your confidence, do you not envisage a situation where the parents have a very different outlook to local authorities and ultimately they just aren't going to get their entitlement so because again, parental choice will be different from local authority? Again, what you're saying to me is that you do not have confidence that local authorities can act in the interests of children along with parents. I do not share that view. Well, what I'm saying to you is I have confidence in the parents, actually, to be perfectly honest, and I really can't understand how you can't hear what the committee are actually saying to you and take that on board. You know, there's not I, a lot I, of children so in this category. So I've, so I've said I'm willing to look at the numbers with COSLA. We'll certainly explore this with COSLA. Um, I'm willing to strengthen statutory guidance so that um, the factors which ought to be taken into account when the decision is made um, are, are clearer. I am happy to look at this area, but I have confidence that the local authorities act in the best interests of children. I still think there's an, an anomaly and perhaps should look at that, but thank you. I think that uh, concludes questions. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we move to agenda item.
4, uh, Children and Young People's Scotland Act 2014 Modification No. 1, Order 2019 SSI 2019 Draft Debate. And it's, oh, sorry. Yes, so we are. We're moving to the formal debate on motion S5M 17294 in the name of the Minister. I remind everyone that officials are not permitted to contribute to the formal debate. And I invite any contributions from members of the committee. Minister, do you wish to say anything at this stage? Thank you. I now put the question to the committee. The question is that motion S5M15. Sorry, um, it was a mistake in my... Thank you. Uh, the question is that motion S5M17294 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Agenda item five, again, is um, the formal debate on motion S5M17295. And I ask the minister to uh, move the motion. Moved. Thanks. Uh, invite contributions from members. Minister, do you wish to say anything else at this stage? No. Thank you. Uh, I now put the question to the committee that motion S5M17295 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Indeed. Thank you. The committee will report to Parliament on these instruments. Are members content for me as convener to sign off a report to Parliament on this instrument? Yes. Thank you. That concludes consideration of subordinate legislation. Uh, can I thank the Minister and her officials for the attendance this morning and I will suspend the meeting for a few moments. Uh, thank you. Um, we now move to agenda item six, which is our inquiry into subject choices. It's the sixth evidence session in the committee's inquiry, and can welcome to the meeting Dr. Janet Brown, Chief Executive, Dr. Gil Stewart, Director of Qualifications, and James Morgan, Head of Research Policy Standards and Statistics, all from the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Um, if the panel could indicate to me if they wish to uh, ask answer any of the questions posed by the committee. I understand, uh, Dr Brown, you want a brief introductory statement. Yes. Thank you. Um, good morning, committee. Um, I just wanted to give a bit of a background of where we are. SQA has been a member of the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board throughout the development and delivery of the programme. And we are also now a part of the Scottish Education Council, which is chaired by the Deputy First Minister to discuss education matters. SQA's role in CFE was to develop new qualifications for the senior phase that would reflect the principles of CFE and build on the experiences and outcomes of the broad general education that had been introduced both in the early years and in the secondary school through the end of S3. The courses are designed to develop the knowledge and have a clear focus on understanding and skills development and also the application of those in different contexts. But in addition to the nationals, hires and advanced hires, SQA has a wide range of other qualifications and awards at all SCQF levels, many of which can support the diverse interests and needs of young people in the senior phase. These courses range from skills for work courses, vocational and personal development, through higher nationals to foundation apprenticeships. Teachers and learners have a wide range of options for different pathways which can be tailored to the needs of individual learners. So as uh, you know, we are now uh, joined by the Director of Qualifications Development who is uh, 
present throughout the, the curriculum for excellence period, and also James, who is responsible for research policy, statistics and standards. And we very much look forward to answering and, and contributing to the committee's study around subject choice. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move to questions from the committee, and we begin with Ms Smith. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr Brown. Um, we've had it put to us that if you take uh, Curriculum for Excellence as uh, 3 to 18, um, there has been some concern from uh, previous witnesses that the broad general education, um, the structure of that, was designed by different people from uh, the people who were designing the senior phase, um, possibly with good intentions and, you know, given that your role is obviously to design the uh, qualifications. With hindsight, do you think that that was wise and that there is has been a disconnect between the broad general education and the senior phase? I think uh, the, the, the way in which the, 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 the process was undertaken was to, to ensure that a broad ed general education was in place before the qualifications were uh, started upon. So that was one of the uh, original decisions, so that assessment did not lead learning. That was the fundamental premise. What SQA have done over the past few years is actually done uh, a, a couple of research programs where we've gone and interviewed schools, both head teachers, senior management teams, teachers themselves, and also the pupils and parents, to ask how they feel about broad general education and how they feel about the, the senior phase. The first study we undertook indicated that there, there was not a smooth pathway from BGE into the senior phase. But the second year that we did that research, it, there was obviously a lot of progress that had been made. So I think, I think as, as any program, you can learn lessons from going back and looking how you could do it better. And I think what is happening now is, is there's, there has definitely been a much more obvious um, understanding of how you progress through broad, broad general education to make sure you're ready for en entering the courses in senior phase. The courses were developed uh, at, at the request of the Curriculum for Excellence management team to build on the experiences and outcomes of BGE. And National 4, for instance, was built on the assumption that, that en entering candidates would have uh, reached Curriculum Level 3 at the end of broad general education in order to be successful in National 4, and similarly to have uh, achieved Curriculum Level 4 to be successful at National 5. And I think we're much more, um, everyone is much more familiar with it, with what is happening in broad general education and the requirements for the entry point for the national qualifications. Okay. So, so I, think that I think it's getting better. Right. Could, could I just ask you to confirm then that you are uh, very comfortable with the 3 plus 3 model um, because we've obviously had criticism from some witnesses that they feel that 3 plus 3 has uh, not been as satisfactory as was previously imagined. Are you comfortable with the 3 plus 3 model? I, I think what, what we should be talking about is what is best for the individual child. And, and I do recognise that that is, that is dependent on how a school can deliver that. So the, the philosophy of broad general education going through to the end of S3 was articulated in building the Curriculum 3, the document that came out from the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. Uh, and, and I think it's really important to think about what is best for that individual child. And uh, you can see that the, one of the aims of, broad, of, of Curriculum for Excellence was not only to ensure that more people, more, more students reached a certain level, but also to give them a broader education for a longer period of time. And that is where um, the 3 plus 3 came from. I think different schools do different things for different children. And that is the way that curriculum for excellence should be. Well, I, I think you've put your finger right on it because obviously there is concern that there, I mean, if you accept that the you know, flexibility was one of the key principles underpinning uh, curriculum for excellence and therefore, uh, in theory, you could argue that different schools would have a three plus three or three plus two plus one, or they would have two plus two plus two. Um, you know, th there is that option for schools to do things in different ways. The problem is, that in terms of some of the evidence that has been presented mm -hmm. to this committee now over six sessions, is it, I think, um, the, the, the subject choice issue um, is a major concern, particularly if you look at the statistics about the uh, considerable drop-off in the numbers taking of, in modern languages, uh, particularly German and French, uh, and in some of the STEM subjects. And that the, the real issue for a lot of parents is that while the broad general education may have given them greater uh, width and um, breadth than was possible before, 
with some new subjects, as you said in your opening statement, that actually when it comes to the core curriculum, uh, there is a problem about this subject choice. Do you accept these concerns that there is a problem with subject choice? I think it would be uh, good if we could move to the, to the discussion of subject choice broader than just nationals because I think there are some children who benefited a lot from the old system of going through standard grades straight to hires and, and to advanced hires, but not all children benefited from that. And I think it's important to understand that there is a wider range of options. Um, I think the, the school has the, has the opportunity to be able to provide that range of options these days through the partnerships they have with other schools. Um, I think it, 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 it is a question of thinking about the outcome of all of education, not just S4. It's about the outcome at the end of the senior phase, and is that a better point for children these days than it used to be in the old system? Could, could I just ask you in that context, Dr Brain, would you be comfortable with a local authority uh, that takes a one-size-fits-all uh, policy when it comes to subject choice, the numbers that are being done in S4, because that's um, a blanket policy for some local authorities, not all. Um, are you comfortable with that, given what you're saying about flexibility? I have to say that that is not SQA's responsibility, and I know that that... Are you comfortable with it? I, I, I think for some children... Um, Sorry, I, are you, are you comfortable like with a local authority taking it? I would a, like to see flexibility, which is the fu fundamental philosophy of CFE, is something should be tailored for the child. It should be child-centric. OK, thank you. Um, Ms. Goldruth. Thank you. Good morning to the panel. Um, so we know that roughly, I think, 50% of schools uh, study six subjects in S4, 40% study seven, 10% study eight. So there is that variance nationally. And I think there was, to some extent, a variance under standard grade as well. Mm -hmm. William Hardy from the Royal Society told committee this was because of the 160 hour allocation driven by the SQA. Is he right? What, um, I, I will touch a little bit, and then I'll probably ask James to, to um, give you a bit more of the detail. Um, we, we take children making, we take learners making an assumption of the entry point, and then we understand where we're trying to take them within a given course. We then look at that in terms of how long does that take the average child to undertake. That is no different now than it used to be. What we've done is we've, we've broadened the... Uh, broad general education to enable people to take more subjects for longer, which is why it now continues into S3. But James can, I think, talk, talk a little bit about the detail of the 160 hours. Yes, um, thank you. The, the 160 hours is not a new term. Um, that's something that we've seen in the legacy qualifications, intermediate one, two and higher. And that was, that was the, the, which is essentially the DNA of the structure of the current um, National 4, um, National 5 and higher. The 160 hours is, is something that was specified, although the, the real measure that SQA uses as a partner of the Scottish Qualifications and Credit Framework is SEQF credit points and level. So the qualifications are actually the same size, they're 240 hours of learning. The 160 hours is effectively directed learning in the classroom, in that environment, and there's 80 hours self-directed learning. So comparing um, National 4, 5 and higher to the previous qualifications, intermediate 1, 2 and higher, they're exactly the, exactly the same. And also at standard grade, they attracted 24 SEQF credit points as well. And how many hours were under standard grade then? They attracted 240, hour, um, 240 hours in total, um, 24 SEQF credit points. I think the difference is there was an, a specif specification of standard grade the, the way that it was with 160 hours, and that essentially came about in the higher still developments because they were unit-based, and it was that's how it could be structured so, so um, clearly. Yeah, I guess my point is standard grade wasn't unit-based in the same way that higher still was. So, what were the hour allocations for standard grade within school, out with you know not considering that self-directed study? That's a good question. I don't have the answer to that. Um, okay. That that was a, a decision made a long time ago. Yeah. Um, those are legacy qualifications that predated the SEQF. 160 hours, I think, it was all in standard grade. I think some schools, in reality, gave a bit longer in some instances for maths and English. But again, that was at the discretion of um, individual schools and local authorities. And remember, standard grade dates from the 1980s, and SEQF is a more kind of recent... Um, development, um, yeah. so there, there wasn't so much um, so much specificity in things like standard grade about number of hours of learning as there is in kind of current day qualifications because we have the SCQF in Scotland. So that really brought 
about more standardisation. Yeah. The other thing I would add to the, the comments about 160 hours and one year courses is the whole kind of ethos and philosophy of CFE was about a three year senior phase building on the broad general education. And you know some of the criticisms of the previous qualifications was um, the so-called two-term dash to hire and trying to fit hire into a very short time period. And one of the things that Curriculum for Excellence was trying to address was the depth of learning and giving young people more opportunity for depth of learning. So it, it was envisaged originally that the senior phase would be a three-year phase and that there would be a mixture of young people doing courses over one year, over two years. So it was never envisaged that everybody would you know, do one set of qualifications one year and then another set. A much more mixed economy was envisaged that you know, schools would maybe... So, for instance, um, I know some schools who do things like English and maths over, over two years because they feel that depth of learning um, helps consolidate um, young people's learning and is much better because maths and English are so fundamental to all the other learning that young people do. So the whole kind of ethos and philosophy was to address some of the weaknesses of the previous system and that lack of depth of learning was perceived as a weakness of the previous system. So, yeah. and, and, and again, it was this giving schools that flexibility and empowerment to offer different sorts of approaches that they felt met the needs of the young people, um, which could be different for different subjects or different year groups. Thank you. I mean, I understand the ethos, but obviously, given that I think 50% of schools are, are still, you know, studying seven or eight subjects, the ethos maybe hasn't moved on because it's impossible to timetable more than, I think, five subjects in one school year. Um, so you therefore have to start studying the qualifications earlier. And that actually goes against what the BGE was meant to be about. So there is a tension there. I think you, you would maybe accept um, when schools are trying to fit that 160 hours of course content into the year. Um, I'm really interested in the relationship between the SQA and Education Scotland. Um, I should probably say that I was uh, formally seconded to Education Scotland. Um, are you still based in the Optima building in Glasgow? So they're just up the stairs from you then in the same building. You don't sit very far apart. Um, do you meet regularly? Do you talk about these things? Do you have any input, for example, into what timetabling should look like? Maybe not in a directive kind of way, but even just to have these kind of conversations about how you can look at timetabling 160 hour qualifications in the school year. Well, we do, first and foremost, we do engage a lot with Education Scotland, particularly around individual subjects, and, 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 and we've spent a lot of time looking at that interface between BGE and, and the senior phase. In terms of timetabling, that is not something that SQA gets involved in at all. It's, that is very much a matter for schools. The challenge, I think, that you probably heard from, from uh, Larry Flanagan is, is the whole issue of um, when does uh, a national qualification start, when does a national five start, should that be done over two years? If you want to get eight subjects in, you should be doing that over two years. Does every does every child need to do eight subjects? Uh, th it's that flexibility of timetabling that is the nature of uh, it's best done at the school level. So no, we don't have any engagement at all in the in the timetabling discussions. But you do tell schools how many hours they should be teaching subjects for. We we give them an indication of how long it. it the average child is likely to need to be able to get from this level of learning to that level of learning based on the courses that we undertake. OK. Um, just a final question then, Kamina. Um, Dr Stewart, I was looking at an article, um, I think an interview done in the test in 2011, and you said the idea for the Curriculum for Excellence Development programme was that curriculum uh, development came first and qualifications followed. The qualification will build on outcomes, so there shouldn't be any shocks. Um, so removing the outcome and assessment standards then was meant to reduce teacher workload. And I guess I might have a concern as a former teacher about how you are assured that pupils are being presented at the right levels now if that continuous assessment is not in place anymore. I think we... <sighs> Teachers are very good at understanding where, where their, their young people are in relation to their learning. The most tangible way that SQA sees that is that we ask uh, teachers to submit estimates of what they think the grade is that each young person will achieve. Um, so I think that tells us that there's a reasonable degree of congruence between teacher judgments and, and SQA judgments. So they do have a good understanding. It's the same courses 
you know, the, the courses that we have just now with the revisions, the removal of units are the same courses with the same outcomes of learning as they were previously. So the, the courses, the content has not changed in those revisions that have happened. But they don't have to record whether the pupil has overcome the outcomes, as I understand it, whereas yes. they did previously. But we, we would expect teachers to be doing that as a matter of course. But they don't have to anymore. They don't have to provide that information to SQA anymore. Right. They, have to do it with, well, they will have to do it within the schools. Teachers will do that during the course of a, a I teaching know that, process. But my concern is that a pupil could drift along all year, sitting at higher level, for example, and then be presented for that qualification, but not actually be ready to set that level of qualification because we've removed the outcome assessment standards. One would hope that teachers don't, but most teachers will absolutely monitor the progress of all students during the course of that teaching year. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Gray. Um, a couple of points of clarification following on from um, Jenny Gorey's questions. Um, I, I'm interested in this notion of uh, deeper learning. I mean, that's something that's come up in evidence when we've asked other um, stakeholders or witnesses uh, about the reduced number of subjects studied. They've talked about deeper study. And, and uh, I think it was yourself, Dr Stewart, talked about that there. But if the... Um, credit points are the same if the, the uh, notional hours, 160, are the same for the new national courses as they were. For that, that, there, it's not any deeper, is it? Well, the number of hours is, is the same, as you see. So the depth is the same, in uh, fact. If, could I? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's all about le learning is a continuum. You know, that's, that, that's how we, we developed Curriculum for Excellence. It was meant to be a three to 18 continuum of learning. And um, if you do fewer subjects in um, S4, then you have the opportunity to have deeper learning. Now, I think that this is fundamental to helping you to move on to the next stage. So I'm a scientist. Um, and um, so James is not a scientist, so he could study a National 5 biology course and he could get a C and he could have a very sketchy, not a deep understanding of some of the biological concepts in that course. Um, however, I studied and I have a deep understanding at National 5 and I get an E, but that's not important. What's important is that I am very well placed because of my depth of understanding of the biological concepts and so on and the ability to apply those so that when I move on to higher, I do better. And that's where the depth of learning comes in for me because it's about having a stronger foundation for learners to move on. And we see that from Scottish Government data that they publish about the outcomes for young people by the time they get to the end of the senior phase. The outcomes in terms of the levels that young people are achieving have gone up over the period of Curriculum for Excellence. So that, to me, is telling us that there's something that's working there, that we're getting a greater depth of learning and that we're getting more young people up to a higher level of qualification. But I don't really understand the point you're making in terms of subject choice in the curriculum, because you and James may have attained a different level of understanding of biology in this case, but you didn't do it because you studied for more hours. You both well, studied it, for the same, the yeah. same hours. Well, so if, if James studied eight subjects, and I studied six subjects. He won't have had 160 hours for each subject. I will have had 160 hours learning. Mm. But, but he will have had if the school understands <laughs> Curriculum for Excellence and has taught that biology course across two years. He will have, but, but we, we know from speaking to teachers that that doesn't always happen in every case. OK. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, there was some discussion, Jenny Ruth was asking about the relationship with Education Scotland and the proximity. When Edu Education Scotland gave evidence, um, Jenny Ruth asked them about the 160 hours, and they said, I haven't got the quote in front of me, but they said that the 160 hours was not all contact teaching time. But your submission 
explicitly says that the 160 hours is contact teaching time. So are Education Scotland wrong? I think that the, the, there is always this debate is when does teach, when does learning start for a particular course, right? Um, um, our, ex, our understanding and our expectation is that in order to cover the course content for the average child, you would have to have a teaching time of around 160 hours. How much of that can be undertaken during the course of a child who's very advanced through broad general education? is at the discretion of the teacher. Some people will start the learning, not necessarily the assessment, but the learning of a, a, a National 5 course earlier than they, than they would in going into S4, for instance. So I think it, 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 we believe that um, teachers are really the people who are imparting a lot of knowledge. We also believe that some students work very well on their own. It is, again, very tailored to the individual, but our expectation is that it would take approximately 160 hours for the average student to be able to be taught the nature of the content that we have in National 5 courses. So Education Scotland are wrong. They're, there's a misinterpretation I think, of I, your... I think there can be misinterpretations okay. of what we're trying to do. Thanks. Okay, Ms. Smith, you want to say? Simple point, Dr. Stewart. You argued about being a scientist that you know if you were in a uh, a school that was offering six subjects in S4 and you did English, maths, and your uh, three sciences, biology, physics, and chemistry, you'd have uh, deeper learning. Are you concerned at all that that would actually not be a very broad curriculum, that that would be English and maths and just science, that you wouldn't have the facility to do um, a, a social science and languages in the way that was previous? In other words, you've jumped from what is a, a much broader BGE into quite a narrow um, uh, senior phase. Are you, are you worried about that? Again, I think those are decisions that you have to make for individual young people. So if I was a young person who was very clear about um, I wanted to go on and do medicine or, or wanted to be a vet um, or wanted to go on and be a physicist, heaven forbid, <laughs> um, then, you know, I think that would be, to me, that would be an okay course of study for that young person to undertake. Remembering that that young person has had that broader broad general education prior to that. Dr Stewart, that in, a, in a school that's uh, got the four, uh, S4 subject option of just six, mm -hmm. uh, that person is constrained more heavily than somebody in a seven or an eight uh, column structure who can do the three sciences but can also pick up a social science uh, and yes. a language. Do, do you accept that? Yes, I do accept that. So, but my other point that I was going to make was if you have a young person who's not sure about what they want to do, and many young people, you know, as parents and so on, we, we know many young people are not clear when they're at school what they want to do. So I presume schools would not advise young people that are unsure about what their future career path is to go down that narrowing of their, their options. <laughs> so they might advise them to keep a broader kind of uh, choice at S4. Dr. Brown, yeah. Can I, can I just add? I, I think um, one of one of the other things that we've, we 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 think about, and that many of your witnesses have also mentioned, is that is the whole point of the two-year qualification, rather than trying to do everything in S4 and and the ladder point. So so for me, that conversation I think needs to get. Um, needs to be disseminated a lot wider across Scotland. So if you're thinking about students who potentially are very, very interested in doing sciences, then, then the option is why do they, and they are judged by their teachers to be very competent learners, that they are going to be successful in their particular subjects that they're thinking about, then not doing a National 5 but going straight on to a higher allows that time period in which they can keep their curriculum broader for longer. And I think that that whole um, movement that was envisaged with CFE has not happened as quickly or as much as the, the people felt that it should. Uh, and I think that is what we should be talking about, is how do we actually make sure that we don't have the treadmill of National 5 to higher to advanced higher. You actually say, if this child is going to be successful at higher, let's allow them to have a broader curriculum during the, during the two-year period and present them for maybe some National 5s, but also some hires. So it keeps that breadth. But you think about that senior phase as a three-year senior phase, not an individual National 4. That 
is not happening across the country, and I think that is, that is one of the reasons that I think we're in this debate about numbers of subjects. Ms. Lamont. I just wanted to clarify a point with Dr. Stewart in your analogy about, or a description of how much better she was at biology than her, than her colleague. And very poor at physics. And very poor at physics, but then... <laughs> um, you said it's because you only had six subjects and he had eight. Does that mean it's your view that young people should only have six subjects in fourth year? I mean, I think... I'm not sure it's, 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 it's appropriate for me to express a view about whether the, you know, six subjects in S4 is a good view or not. Um, I, think yeah. it, I think it's the role of schools to work <coughs> with the young people, their parents and carers and their local community to agree on an appropriate curriculum that, model. That My son followed a, a, a six, course, um, six courses um, in S4 and I, and I must admit that you know, I had some, some sort of personal wee kind of concerns about that. Um, but uh, I was confident that the school knew what they were doing and I placed my confidence mm -hmm. in the school. And I think as parents, many of us do that, that, you know, we rely on the school to be making kind of good or helping advising us as parents um, to and make I, good I, choices. I, I accept the idea and experience it myself. School's been, you know, talking about flexibility and all the rest of it. It can be largely theoretical if you're presented with a column of six choices and... I've talked already in, in the past about one of these columns not even having anything that a young person might want, but you specifically made the point that the, the, the issue was around depth of learning, and you said that you were able to achieve a greater depth of learning because you were doing six subjects rather than eight. The logic of that is that schools should be doing six. If the whole premise of the argument is we prefer depth to breadth in, in fourth year, then the logic of your position is that you should be saying, in, in your view, as a qualification agency, young people should be studying six, six subjects. That was the basis of your argument. I wonder if that is, in fact, policy, and if it is, what conversations have you had with Education Scotland and the Scottish Government and COSLA and local authorities about whether the, the, whether there's a difference from what you're advocating? Can, can, I, can I say what, we, what I think we're, we're talking about is the amount of time that should be given to learning a subject to the right depth is the critical point here. If you're trying to get that number of subjects into one year, then I think you are limiting the amount of time that's available for good learning and teaching to allow that depth. So the question is, how do you ensure that any student gets the right amount of um, support, learning and, and, and assessment that allows them to be confident in the subject. And if you're so trying it's not to get sustainable then with respect for you to do eight subjects in fourth year. If you start on the assumption that they are starting from scratch in, in, in S4, then I, th I think it is a real challenge to be able to include eight subjects. So you think it's acceptable then if they started their learning in third year? given that some of the calculation is what you do when you're not in the classroom, would it be acceptable to count hours from third year? That is, that is a matter for schools. If schools decide to do that, that is, that is an important component. But the, the, the philosophy of CFE is that you maintain that breadth in S3. So that's, that is so part the of the tension, so I the think, here. shouldn't be doing that, then? That, that I think that's part of the tension. Is Some schools are choosing to... to um, do some specialisation in S3, not complete specialisation, and other, and other schools are not. And I think that, that is that tension of maintaining that breadth and, 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 um, and aspects of depth across those 16 curriculum areas uh, versus moving into more specialisation in S3, but not the complete special, specialisation that you would see in I S4. I just wonder how you think this tension is to be resolved. Whose responsibility is it? I mean, it's one thing to say there's a tension. You could almost argue it's a conflict. Um, how is that resolved, and who has the authority to resolve it? I think, I think that goes back to the whole issue of do we really believe people should be doing qualifications in S4, S5, and S6? And that is the debate that is going on that I think you've heard from other members of, of um, the, with the witnesses in previous sessions that says we should be talking about the whole senior phase, we should be talking about two-year courses, we should, be, we should be measuring 
the outcomes and the achievements and attainment of learners at the end of S6, whether they're in school or whether they're in college or whether they're in, um, they're in work. Uh, and, and for me, that is something that um, we, we as SQA present our data on an annual basis. The data that is used is our data, therefore we talk all the time about annual statistics. What we should be looking at is the outcome at the end of senior phase. Okay. Uh, Dr Allen. Thank you very much uh, and good morning. Um, I was interested in uh, one thing that was said there about um, the number of subjects being what's appropriate. Um, can I just clarify, are we talking here about what's appropriate for a school or what's appropriate for an individual? Because we have had evidence um, given to this committee that some, some of which comes down on one side of that and some of which comes down on the other. So are we talking about appropriate for schools or appropriate for individuals? Well, it should be appropriate for individuals, but it al always, in practicality terms, will be constrained by what school is able to deliver either itself or through its partnerships. And I think that, that is the key thing. Is And, and we, we also need to recognise that some of those... Um, some of those courses will not be nationals. They will be um, national certificates. They will be um, professional uh, development awards. They will be uh, early stage foundation apprenticeships, etc., which will be potentially delivered in other areas. But you obviously have to balance the the focus on the individual with the deliverability of anything in in a particular centre. Yes, because each school will have an average number of subjects that it's delivering to its S4 pupils, but, but within that, there will still be some variation, um, you know, obviously to meet individual needs. I mean, we can see that from the, the, the data. So, and I think that's always been the case, you know, different young people in, in a school would do, say, for example, different numbers of standard grades, and they may also do other programmes as well that sit alongside that. Um, so something else you were saying that, that was interesting was about the continuum of learning, and I, I absolutely buy that. I can I can see that. I can accept that. Um, but one thing that we have had a lot of evidence about is about languages, and it's certainly been put to us that there isn't a continuum when it comes to languages in terms of the, the huge drop off in the number of languages being taken, and not much evidence of them being taken taken up again later on in school. So does the continuum? that you've talked about work for languages? I think the, the, the major drop-off in languages, as, as I think you've heard from previous witnesses, probably occurred when they were no longer compulsory. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what we do see is, we, you were right, we, we've seen a fall off in, in languages and we are fiercely proud of the fact that we've got some really good language qualifications that we really want students to be learning. What we are seeing is a continued strength in the higher it, so it's the, it's the national five and national four subject levels that, that have declined. But higher people who really want to do languages continue to do the higher. Uh, what we have introduced is uh, languages for life and work, where you, you where you're able to do that uh, and and explore languages in a different space. Um, there there as as I think it's possible to to pick up languages later. So I think that's partly why you're seeing a maintenance of the of the numbers at higher rather than the numbers at National Farming. Are those what might be called crash hires, where people are going into a hire really with perhaps little by way of contact with that language since they were in third year? Well, well um, yes. We, we, would, we would call that um, no previous attainment. And that could be somebody who's taken that language over two years and not done a National Five, or they've done it in one year at a later point. They could do it in S6. Um, I, think the, I think the... I'm not a language person, um, but from what I understand is if you have got one language, it's easier to pick up a second language. So the idea of being able to add hires at a later stage when you've only taken the, them to the end of BGE is, is a feasible thing to do. OK, I did Latin at school and I enjoyed it. I would have hesitated to do a, hash, a crash um, higher in, in German on that basis, but never mind. Um, what what I'm, I'm really interested, though, is... Um, uh, the, the rationale about the 3-3 the three, three structure. Now, quite rightly, see, there's, a, there's a mixed economy out there and there's a mixture of approaches by different schools. It was interesting when we um, met with teachers that there was a very mixed economy indeed in terms of how teachers responded to that or reacted to that. Some embraced the idea of 3-3 three, three very enthusiastically. Some uh, appeared to be dying in a ditch uh, by way of opposition to it. 
Did, did, did you anticipate quite such a variety of, of approaches to the way 3.3 would be viewed? That, that, um, w we would participate in those conversations through the CFE Management Board, so that, that is not a responsibility for SQA, but absolutely we are involved in that discussion and have been involved in that discussion for a long time. And, and I think there was very obviously uh, that um, tension again between the people who wanted to widen the curriculum and broaden it out, bring in different subjects, and the others that were very wedded to the, let's make sure that we get eight subjects in, in S4 and five, and then however many in S6. So as in anything in education, there is never a consensus. There's always wide variety of views, and I think that is that was seen uh, and, and continues to today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mr. Greer, did you want? Okay. Yep, thanks, Camilla. Yeah, this will work. Um, I'd like to um, go back to something that uh, Janet Brown referenced in your uh, opening remarks. At one end of the spectrum, at the moment, we have some quite positive outcomes in the number of uh, young people who are leaving school with five hires. At the other end of the spectrum, we have seen an increase in the number of young people who are leaving with no qualifications at all. Why do you think that is? Um, I think. We, we have seen a drop-off in the numbers undertaking National 1 through National 3. Uh, and I think that that is something that we're still trying to understand the detail of. Um, because some of that is, is structural in, the, in terms of the way that they're operated. But one of the things we, we really need to make sure is that, that candidates are entered for the levels of qualification that the teachers believe they can achieve. Qualifications shouldn't be just bars to jump over. They should be a recognition of people's learning. And, and if a teacher believes an individual might make a national five, um, but they put them in for a five, but they don't get good learning and they get a four in the current system, that is a real challenge. Similarly, if somebody should be doing a national three and they're doing a national four and they don't achieve a national four, I think it's, it, it's, Scotland is one of the few places that has such a wide variety of uh, levels of qualification that any student should get, as well as the breadth of the qualifications in terms of the, num the nature of the learning. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it, it is something that we need to be making sure that people have recognised the value of the lower SCQF level qualifications. So S3, na National 3, is a valuable qualification for those individuals that get it. Yeah, so uh, as you say, we, we have a, a qualification structure that means that really any, any young person should be able to leave school with qualifications. Um, you seem to be indicating that part of this issue, won't be all of it, but part of this issue is there are some young people simply being put forward for a level of qualification that they're not likely to meet. Where do you think that problem is coming from? Is that uh, down to issues of misunderstanding at, at school level? Is this something uh, where the pressure is coming from local authorities? Because if it's happening systematically enough for us to have seen this increase, and in some areas in Dumfries and Galway, it's 4.5% you know, of young people there. That's quite a significant increase from, I think, the 1% that it was previously. Why, why is that occurring? Where do you think the problem is beginning there? Is it local authority? Is it school? Is it something structural that we can address nationally? I, I don't think we fully, uh, we, we as SQA do not fully understand why that's happening. Uh, and we are, we are working with partners obviously to try and understand how, what, what, what the, the causes behind this is. Um, but I think it is important um, as a society that we overtly recognise the value of the lower level qualifications. Because there is a concern that if all we talk about is national fives and hires, everything else is not valued. And I think we collectively have a responsibility to recognise the value of a national one. And I, I would challenge anyone to meet a parent who, whose very challenged child has achieved a, an SQA certification in national one to not be incredibly proud of the fact that that child has achieved that, that recognition. And we need to recognise that as a society. Could you go into a little bit more detail? You're saying that you're working with partners to fight, try and find out what's happening. Could you go into a bit more detail about the process here? What, what research are you undertaking to figure out exactly why this increase has occurred? James? I think one of the challenges of SK's data and the limitations of it as well, um, which you have to be clear about, is that we only see learners and candidates when they're entered for SK qualification. So we don't really have an overview of the, the whole cohort in Scotland at any one time. Um, and it's when a learner actually has entered for an SQA qualification. It's effectively when we, we give you a visibility of that learner and that, that individual. 
Um, and I think that's one of the, one of the, the, the absolute limitations of, of what we can actually comment on and try and understand. Um, we, we see different things in terms of our, our data that uh, once a certification has taken place, but actually finding out um, real um, causality is what's happening there is challenging for us because we only see learners once they're entered. We don't know the richness of the system, the richness of those individuals' lives and learning and teaching and how they actually come to SQA. I, I accept that, but if you could just lay out, you, you've indicated that there, there is a process. You are working with others. We, we have been, we've been meeting with um, Scottish Government statistics people because they have the cohort information mm -hmm. and with Education Scotland and, and discussing the nature of the, the sorts of results that we see. And I think that's important. I think the point I was going to make was, was about the, the Scottish Government Insight tool that you know Scottish Government can look nationally at what the data is telling them, but schools, more importantly, can look at a local level at how, how their young people are, are performing, and they can split that data in lots of different ways. So they can look by SIMD quintiles, um, and they can, they can try out different approaches within their school. So, you know, you mentioned Dumfries and Galloway and the 4% that are not achieving. I'm presuming that some of those schools in Dumfries and Galloway will be trying out different sorts of approaches for those young people to see how they can, how can they find some learning, a type of learning that will engage those young people and get them back engaged in, in their education and help them to achieve and ultimately to uh, get a positive destination. So I, I think there's a lot of that work that has to go on at a local level. And I think the Insight tool provides a broader set of measures for schools to look at. So they have the the positive destination measure at the, for school leavers. They have the measures about literacy and numeracy, and we've seen improvements in literacy and numeracy. They also have measures about the highest level of SCQF level, uh, not just SQA qualifications, but other types of qualifications as well. So they measure things like ASDA and Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Trust and so on. So they will have all of that data Scottish Government has all that data at a national level, but also schools will have that at a local level, and they will be able to try out different approaches for different groups of young people and then see what impact that has. And I think it's only really by um, you know, looking at what's working for young people, because the, one of the kind of underpinnings of the original Building the Curriculum 3 document um, was an OECD report about equity and quality in Scottish education. And they talked um, very eloquently about the strengths of the Scottish system, but, but they also talked about some of the inequity being within school. And you know, that, that is, is primarily one of our focuses in, through the CFE work that we're all engaged in, is, is to you know, bring up the, the young people at that end. So I, I, I haven't got an answer for you, but I think, I think there are measurement tools at a local level which schools can use to help address and try out different approaches. Because one of the things that OECD wo said was many young people, particularly high achievers, are motivated by where they want to get to. So, you know, I, I want to get to university, so I'm motivated to work hard and to achieve in order to get to university. But the bit that they talked about that Scotland didn't quite have right, which is way back in 2009, was those young people that don't have that, that external motivation, you know, they're, they're not clear about what they want to do. They've maybe not found anything that they're really good at so far at school, you know. And so they, they talked about it's the curriculum itself that you've got to motivate those young people with. You've got to find something that really engages with that, those young people, whether it's a vocational area or it's something like the Duke of Edinburgh or ASDAN that gets them back engaged in education, that gets them to be a bit successful in something, and then, they, then that motivates them to kind of move on to the next level. So that's what the OEC was, was challenging Scotland to do. And I think that's what collectively across all our schools and local authorities, people are trying to do in lots of different ways. Um, Absolutely. The, you know, when we look at the data, we see it's not a uniform trend. So obviously there are issues that need to be identified in local areas, but there is a trend here. Nationally, this number has uh, 
increased. So I suppose my final question is, I accept that you don't have an answer this morning. You have identified that you are working uh, with the government, with partners, I suggest with Education Scotland and with local authorities. When will you be able to come back to us and say why you as the Qualifications Authority believe there are more young people leaving with no qualifications? I, I think the, 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 the question is, how can, our, how can SQA's data help on make that, um, give an answer to that question? Um, the responsibility for understanding what's happening in the system is collective, I agree, we should be part of that. But SQA's responsibility is to provide the data to be able, the data that we have to be able to add to the data that others have in, in terms of understanding the answer to that question. So I would, I would say that we collectively, as, um, as a group of um, stakeholders, should be working together to get that, that answer for you. When, okay, when will you be able to make your contribution to that? When will the SQA, you, I accept that there's collective responsibility here. This committee has been through that on a number of occasions, trying to figure out where responsibility for curriculum for excellence lies in its, its many forms. But the reality is you are the qualifications authority. There are more young people in Scotland leaving school with no qualifications than before you have a significant amount of responsibility in this area. I'm not saying that the fault lies necessarily with decisions taken by the SQA, but you have clear responsibility in the realm of qualifications. When will you be able to make your contribution to us collectively, figuring out the answer, what, what is causing this problem? Well, my view is that we need to be doing that over the next year or so, because, because uh, we need to understand what's happening this summer because that's, that's another, another set of data that's going to come in. We have seen, as I said earlier, that there's been a change in the approach to broad general education over the past few years. We should be seeing that coming through in the summer. So we need to monitor that. We also need to make sure that we understand what's happening at a cohort level, not just as an entries level, because that's, that's a key piece here. Uh, you may have noticed in the press, I think a couple of days ago, uh, down south there is this... this um, pattern of people removing children from being entered for qualifications to maintain the attainment. Uh, we do not believe that that is happening in Scotland. We do not want that to happen in Scotland, but we need to understand the cohort measure as well as the entrance just measure. Very specific on that point, and just to, to finish, convener, uh, Dr. Brown, that might not be happening as commonly in Scotland yes. as it is down south. It is absolutely happening in Scotland. I can say from the authority of my cousin experienced that this year until his entire class were not put forward for a qualification. That decision was taken in February, and it was only reversed towards the end of March after the intervention of parents and local elected members. So there are schools in Scotland who are still trying to do this. I accept it's not at the level in England, but it is absolutely happening. And that's why it's really, really important that then, the, especially given that data, that we look at cohort, not just at entries. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. OK. I a couple of quick supplementaries, but uh, Ms. Mackay. Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, it was really just uh, to follow up on uh, Ross Creer's line of questioning about data. Um, our briefing tells us that the SQA holds a rich um, set of, of data, and um, Dr. Alan Britton told committee that um, we have very little research evidence about the impact of the different models schools have been left to try things out. So my question is: Do you think you've been proactive enough in following up? via your data, and I understand it's collective attainment levels, and just to, to, to feed back to how um, these models are performing. I mean, have you been liaising with local authorities on a regular basis? Um, or do you feel you've got a rich set of data? What are you, you know, how does that actually work for you? Our, d our data does not contain any information on the curriculum models that are undertaken in schools. So I, as I mentioned earlier in, in relation to Dr. Allen's question, um, the, whether someone has crashed a subject at higher or whether someone has taken that over two years, so whether they've done one year or two years for a higher, we don't have that information. That, that I understand has to be, that. So what sort of data do you have then? We, we have the data of um, the attainment based on an entry at a particular time, so we know the, the age and stage of that uh, individual, but we don't know the curriculum model that that individual has undertaken. And so it needs to be it needs to be collected. Our data can be used by local authorities and by individual schools who know what their curriculum model is. Um, they can they can see whether a change in their curriculum model has had a positive or negative impact on the attainment of their students. Yeah. We don't have that curriculum model information, and we and cannot that do that be, analysis. Should, that, should you not be requesting that? Should it not be fed back to you so that you can see the, the bigger picture? 
Well, I, th I think that goes back to, to um, uh, this is going to sound like uh, it's not our problem, but it is our problem because we are part of the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, it, SQA's responsibility within the education system is to provide qualifications and provide the data on attainment on an annual basis for those qualifications. That can be used by the system to understand how the system is working and how to improve it. And our information should be used by people who understand what the curriculum models are in schools to understand whether that has been a positive or a, a negative change in the, in the level of attainment. So we need to be part of that conversation, but SQA does not have a, a, an overt remit that says, go off and measure the, the, the difference in the attainment of a three plus three versus a two plus two plus two. Mm -hmm. And that will also depend on individual children, because one child may benefit with a three plus three, another child might benefit from a two plus two plus two. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Gray, you wanted to... So the, <clears throat> I was d delighted, um, Dr. Brown, to hear you talking about the importance of value and lo lower level qualifications, because in my view, far too often in this debate, we're told that um, young people who get five hires are still getting five hires, so all's well with the world, and I, I, I personally don't think that's good enough. But in talking about data, um, this inquiry was really generated in part by data produced by people like Professor Scott, which showed um, a reduction in uh, subjects being uh, studied at S4, but also a significant reduction in both enrolment and attainment uh, at levels four and five um, in the new exams compared to previous standard grade exams. And in fact, the data in your tables rather tells the same story. The numbers might be marginally different, but, but huge drop off um, in both enrolment and attainment at levels four and five. Given what you've just said, do you not think your data shows that there are a cohort of young people here who are being failed by the system of which you're part at the moment? I think the, if, if we go back to what CFE was trying to achieve, CFE was trying to achieve not just people getting pieces of paper and qualifications, but people actually having the ability to apply that learning in different contexts, to have a, a comfort level with that learning that would enable them to be successful in the future and more successful in their future destinations. And in order to do that, there was the philosophy that said, we should be measuring their attainment at the end of S6 or at the end of, uh, uh, when they're 18, whether they're in school or whether they're in college or whether they're in work. And I think um, the, the total number of qualifications someone achieves, when you go to a university, universities in Scotland do not ask how many national fives you've got. They ask you about your hire. Once you've overtaken one level, you get to the next level, and that's what's important. It's rare for a, a company to go back and ask what the hires somebody did. It's their degree. So the question that I have for the committee is, what is the level of attainment that we're actually measuring in Scotland? Is it what children, what learners have achieved at, at the age of 18? And does it matter whether they got a National 5 under higher in, in French? Or does it matter that they've, at, uh, they've but, attained a deep understanding of higher French? But we're back to talking about those young people who achieve hires. But, there but, are a group of young people for whom National 4, National 5, or indeed lower levels, you, you gave yes. an example yourself earlier on, will be what they achieve yes. in yes. school, are we not failing that cohort of young people? They are coming out with fewer qualifications and a lower level of achievement than they did in 2011, 12, 13. I, I think that the issue there is that differentiation of the cohort. So I, I, I did make the mistake of mentioning the hires. But if you look at the, at the, at the, at the progression of children uh, of learners who are coming out of S4 and moving into more vocational courses that are much more suited to them. They may have attained a National 5, but did they actually learn the, uh, of, of, of a standard grade um, um, general? But are we, are we actually at a point where they're actually pursuing a much more positive life path for them? Okay, well, my question is, do we have the data which allows us to interrogate that question? Because I don't think we do. I don't think we do either. No. Right. Okay. I think the Scottish Government, through the insight data, would have a more complete picture of, because it includes not just SQA qualifications, national courses, 
vocational qualifications, but in, it includes... Well, to demonstrate to us whether... I think we will have more information. Okay. Yes, they will have more information. Right. What, one, one last very, very to-the-point question. We're talking about the value of low, lower-level qualifications. A number of the submissions to the committee have said categorically that the National Four, uh, the National Four qualification is considered worthless. And, and I'm not paraphrasing. Worthless is what they say. I, I just would like you to respond to that. Well, um, we, we have just done a credibility survey, which is uh, totally random, run by uh, an external organisation where they met people on the street and they, uh, they made telephone calls randomly. We've, we've got data that actually shows that for National 4, those um, for, for young people, for potential candidates and for mature candidates for National 4, though the, the percentage who felt that there was a low credibility for National 4 was around 18%. Uh, the highest percentage of low credibility of National 4 was among teachers, which is 37%. Employers was 15%. I think we need to address the credibility of National 4 because it is a very valuable qualification. Yes, there is no external examination, but there are no external examinations in higher national certificates, higher national diplomas. It is about perception, and it, it is also about ensuring that those learners who achieve certification at National 4 have actually achieved the learning and the, and the knowledge and the skills that are demonstrated in National 4. So my view is we really, really need to make sure that, that those that National 4 was designed specifically for those students who would be going on to courses that do not have examinations and where examinations are not best suited to, it, to be able to capture their abilities. So I think there's a huge challenge with regard to the, the credibility of National 4, but I think we really, really, really need to address that. Thanks. Coming in, Ms. Harris. Yes, thank you. Good morning, committee. I would just like to address the subject of multi-level teaching. Now, whilst I appreciate that it, you know, it has always existed, it's now commonplace, and Larry Flanagan of the EIS described it as an explosion. So, I just want to ask your views on, was this part of the consideration when implementing the Curriculum for Excellence senior phase, or you know, was it actually planned for? because the evidence that's been suggested to committee is really suggesting that it just really is an unintended consequence. So what would your views be on that? I, th I think the, the, uh, the, there are two things for me. Multi-age teaching, where you have children who are in, in S4, S5 and S6 learning the same level is, is something that I think was, was understood. Mm -hmm. I think multi-level teaching, where you're teaching National four, five, and higher in the same class was probably an unintended consequence and has come about as a result of the environment in which Curriculum for Excellence has been introduced. Okay, that's super, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Ms. Lamont. Yeah, thank you. I want to go back to this uh, question of equity and fairness. And you made the point yourself that um, down south, we are, the young people are not allowed to see exams or they're taken off their role in order to to prevent any sense of affecting the status of the school, I suppose. What's your view on the equity in downgrading for some young people the qualification to get in fourth year from the past? So in the past, kids at general, not just foundation, but general children would have an external exam that established a level um, of attainment, which is now under NAT4, which is not assessed externally and is a pass or fail. I, I mean, would you accept that that is a form of um, de-rolling, that we're reducing the amount of time and attention that the system gives to those particular young people? Do you want to that? The original design of uh, National 3 and National 4 was, was done through a consultation an open consultation with the public and overseen by the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. And the reason that, as I understand it, that it was decided that National 3 and National 4 should be internally assessed and externally quality assured by SQA was because uh, young people at that level often don't do particularly well with external exams. And from a kind of insider view within SQA, looking at how young people performed at foundation in general and external exams, um, I, I think you could quite clearly see that. So the, the original rationale 
for National 3 and National 4 being internally assessed was from an equity point of view and from a perspective of it was more appropriate for those young people to have their qualifications internally assessed. And the other thing that I would say is we did a piece of field work, I think it was two or three years ago, and we, we had focus groups and we specifically targeted or asked for young people who were doing National 4 or a mix of National 4 and National 5. And young people themselves do not have issues with National 4 being internally assessed. They saw that as a positive. They didn't see it as a negative. They didn't see it as kind of low credibility. But what we do see is that there's much more of a mixed view from teachers and senior managers within schools. So the original rationale for National 4 being in was one that was meant to be, it was, if you like, an equity issue to me, Joanne. It was trying to come up with a form of assessment that would be... Well, if you could point us to that decision, because thus far this committee was unable to get anybody to say we were responsible for making this decision. So if you can point us to that, um, well, it'll be in the that would be management excellent, board. because yeah. frankly, nobody has ever said before that yeah. there was any rationale to it. Everybody said, well, somebody else must have made that decision. Uh -huh. no, I, profoundly, fact, I profoundly disagree with it, but it would be useful uh -huh. if we could see that. Yeah. And I think in terms of equity, then... We know that resource follows qualifications. That's the, re that's the reality. Um, and we may want to look at uptake of, of National 4 in that regard. But um, I presume from what you've said, you're not regarding it as something you would want to see externally um, examined, but that might be something we can look at further. The last point, because I'm conscious of time, um, on this question of equity. So we're told that the qualifications are over three years. We're also told that 75% of looked after young people will leave school in fourth year. So we've built a curriculum system which will perhaps amplify inequality for some young people. Do you accept that's a problem? I, I think for me, um, the, the, the one thing we need to make sure is that we, we ensure that young people who do leave school at the end of S4 have what they need to be successful in where they're going to go, and that where they go, we also make sure that they are continuing their learning. And, and, and that, because some people, um, yes, I, I recognise that that is a really high percentage for looked after young people, um, it, but there are other young people as well. So for everyone who leaves at the end of S4, we need to make sure that we, that as they leave school, they have the right sort of knowledge and skills and learning that is recognised in the most appropriate way. That might be national qualifications, it might be other qualifications with, and awards. With respect, you've already said the system works over three years. I'm saying to you there's a particular disadvantaged group of young people who disproportionately leave at the end of fourth year, so they do not have a curriculum system that's meeting their needs. I think, though, so. I'm presuming, John, that locally, um, locally, schools would know who those looked after young people are and they would put in place appropriate learning arrangements for those young people, although the, the data that you're presenting well, presents a different picture. If they could do that, picture. presumably they could encourage them to stay on at school. This is not an issue about ability. Mm -hmm. This is no. not an issue about circumstance. Yes. And I wonder, do you at least accept there's an issue here that young people, because of their circumstances, not their ability, are leaving school disproportionately at the end of fourth year in a system that's designed for you to stay there till sixth year. How do we address that? I think, I the, the thing for me is we should, we should stop thinking about the senior phase merely as being in school. We need to think about where those young people are going, we, where, whether they're going to college, whether they're going to work environment, and how do we make sure that their learning continues there and that that learning is planned for and that, that, that we take responsibility as a society for that. Because we do think about the senior phase as being all in school, and it's not all in school for everyone, and it shouldn't be all in school for everyone. Um, I think that concludes questions from the committee this morning. Um, can I uh, thank the panel for their attendance this morning? Can I pay a particular thanks to Dr Brown? This is likely to be your last appearance, certainly in this role at committee, and we would like to thank you for your service and wish you all the best for your retiral in July. Thank you. That concludes the public session for this week, and uh, next week will be our final session on the inquiry. It's the 29th of May, and we will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, and I'll now suspend for um, a few minutes as we move into private session.